Hey folks, welcome to Narratives. Narratives is a podcast exploring the ways in which the world is better than in the past, the ways it is worse, and the paths towards a better, more definite vision of the future. I'm your host, Will Jarvis, and I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to this episode. I hope you enjoy it. You can find show notes, transcripts, and videos at narrativespodcast.com. Well, hey, Norman, how are you doing today? I'm quite good. Um, it's quite cold still in Berlin, even though we are already in mid-May, but um, um, I'm fine. Thank you. How are you? Doing good. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. Um, before we hop into some of uh, our questions about your work, could you give us kind of a brief bio and, you know, how did you start thinking about drugs in Nazi Germany? Um, you know, it's such an interesting topic that was really unexplored before you you got to it, it seems like. Yeah, well, I mean, I have been writing uh, novels before. I published three novels in Germany when um, at one point uh, an old friend of mine said I should write my fourth novel about drugs in Nazi Germany, which I an idea uh, that I immediately declined because I said there were no drugs being used. The Nazis were clean-cut teetotalers. <laughs> inventors of the war against drugs. I knew that part of the Nazi propaganda, but he said that he had different information and uh, he challenged me to start a little bit of research, which I did. And then I found that he was actually right. He was a DJ in Berlin, so he's not a writer, but he's a kind of a hobby historian. Um, and then I started writing a novel and showed it to my publisher. And he said, that's not really good because the topic is so interesting that it would be watered down in a novel. He suggested I should write a nonfiction book, um, an idea that I declined because I thought nonfiction books are, necess- are boring. Um, but then I thought about it for two days and I realized that actually his suggestion uh, is the correct one. And um, then I decided that it should also be possible to write non-boring nonfiction books. They, of course, exist, uh, but I hadn't really read a lot of nonfiction books. I'm not that interested in nonfiction. But then I, um, I started to, you know, um, attack the challenge. That's great. And what was kind of the most surprising thing to you in looking at the subject of drug use in Nazi Germany? Well, I mean, when I spoke to my grandfather in the 80s, when he was still alive, he always told me that Nazi Germany was uh, a place where everything was in order. And uh, there was like this myth that um, it was a disciplined society. Uh, So to find out that drugs played such a big role was obviously surprising. And then to see that a big part of Nazi ideology was this um, health duty, they called it. Everyone had to be healthy. Um, Drugs were forbidden and taboo. So to see that in reality, they used quite a lot of drugs and very hard drugs like methamphetamine uh, is interesting in general. Uh, And then in particular, I I thought that the drug um, consumption of Hitler was very interesting because I had not suspected him of using um, especially opioids or cocaine. Uh, which he did. So that was, um, that was actually fascinating to research and write about. Definitely. And how extensive was Hitler's drug use? Well, I mean, this depends on your definition of drug. Um, he certainly had a doctor that liked to give him medications. This is Dr. Theo Morell, who became his personal physician in 36 and gave him almost daily injections of various uh, remedies and substances until 45. So for nine years, Hitler received uh, thousands of injections, which is unusual in itself. Um, And from 36 to 40, that's like the first phase of Hitler's drug intake or drug, drug taking. This, this was, these were mostly vitamins. So not really drugs, actually more supplements. Um, But then in, 41, he received for the first time an opioid, Dolantine, 
And that kind of was a game changer because from that moment on, Hitler had experienced the strong effects of receiving an opioid intravenously. And um, he wanted more of those um, euphoric feelings um, and physical states and mental states. And from 43 to till the end of 44, he received quite a lot of opioids. Um, and also he received hormonal injections like steroids. Um, so it was really kind of a wild mix towards the end, um, especially when, when the war started to become difficult uh, for Germany. Uh, we can see that he was taking more and more drugs to, I would say, flee reality and um, keep his charisma up so he could still convince his generals of his ridiculous and crazy ideas how to how to lead this war so the, the the longer the war takes the more drugs he uses gotcha and he does I, I believe you wrote about this or you've talked about it um he got an uh opioid injection before what a big meeting with Mussolini trying to convince him to stay um as part of the Axis powers in 1943 I believe could you talk about that a little bit yeah, this was in July. I think it was July 18th, 1943. Um, Italy threatened to break away from the Axis. And Hitler was quite depressed about that. He he thought it was like a betrayal by Mussolini. Um, there was a decisive meeting between the two, two dictators uh, in northern Italy. Hitler didn't want to go. He felt pressured. He felt insecure. And um, for the first time before the meeting, he received a new medication called in German Oikodal, which has at its, as its active ingredient uh, oxycodone. And when he, after he received that, his mood uh, completely changed. He became self-confident, euphoric, um, and uh, basically talked nonstop during the meeting with Mussolini, talked for like six hours without stopping, <laughs> um, which was a problem for Mussolini because he simply was not able to discuss his own concerns about the war and certainly wasn't able to tell Hitler that Italy would leave the, the Axis and would, would, would stop the war. Um, and after that meeting... Hitler actually said to Morel that um, the success of this day was all thanks to, to him, to the doctor. So apparently that um, opioid injection was, um, was historical in a way. Definitely guided the course of history there. Um, pervitine, you know, what is it? I may have but butchered the pronunciation there. Um, and, and what impact did it have on the German war effort? Um, Pervitin is, is methamphetamine. It was the brand name that the German company Temmler, who developed um, or found uh, methamphetamine or developed it into a, a medicine, called it. Um, it was patented in 1938 in Germany and quickly became uh, a hit uh, in, the, in the civil society. Uh, it was totally illegal. You could buy it in any pharmacy. You could buy pure methamphetamine, pure crystal meth. Each pill had three milligrams of methamphetamine, contained three milligrams of methamphetamine. And um, at one point there was, um, uh, well, not there was, at one point the um, so-called army physiologist, Professor Otto Ranke, uh, heard about this pervitin, this new medicine that everyone enjoys. Um, Everyone takes uh, in order not to have to sleep so much. I mean, if you take methamphetamine, you don't need to sleep that much, at least in the beginning. Uh, you feel like you have a, an extra boost of energy. So that was kind of the, the word on the street. If you take this pill and you feel better, you are more talk you're talkative, you can stay up longer, you can work more. So he thought that could be interesting for soldiers. And he made tests at the Medical Academy of the, of the German Army giving young medical um, officers uh, pavitin compared it to uh, coffee, caffeine, and placebos and found that on meth, um, you can stay awake longer. You actually become a little bit dumber. He also found that, that the frontal cortex does not solve 
highly complex problems as uh, precisely as uh, as, a, as a SOBA frontal cortex, but it actually solves more uh, questions. It answers, it gives more answers in a, in a period of time. So you, you become faster, you don't sleep as much. And he thought this is great for our soldiers. So um, he tried to contact his superior, the, the uh, what's it called? It's the Surgeon General, it's called in America, I think. That's so the equivalent in Germany, but that, that guy declined it. He didn't understand the concept of, a synthetic stimulant. Um, so when, when Germany invaded Poland, there was no official ruling about methamphetamine, but uh, this Professor Ranke realized, because he asked many uh, medical officers in the field, he realized that many medical officers were already taking it. And then he was then successful to make it an official uh, army drug for the Western campaign, the war against France, Belgium, and, and Holland, and Great Britain. Um, and when Germany attacked France on May 10th, 1940, uh, 35 million dosages of methamphetamine were being uh, used by these um, uh, by the German by the German army and air force. So that blitz campaign that uh, was actually that actually relied on um, the time factor because that that uh, campaign against France only worked if the German troops would be able to move very fast into France and cut off the, the surprised French uh, def the defense forces, uh, encircle them, and uh, they could only do that with the help of methamphetamine, which actually enabled the German soldiers to stay awake for the first uh, couple of days and nights in the campaign. So methamphetamine was highly uh, important for that um astonishing uh, victory in the West. I loved how you told that story, that portion of the story, the move towards or the sweeping across France with Pervid and, um, in your book, that portion of the story was really great. And nobody knows about this. And not, not only does nobody know about this, but like they understand the concept of Blitzkrieg, or at least it's been told to everybody in, in the history books, but they don't understand that like four days of not sleeping straight with tank drivers, like, the military advantage you have there is mind blowing. So when I read that, I I thought, oh, people really don't get it. It's it's four days of not sleeping, which just isn't possible without meth. I I find it. Uh, I, I think it's impossible actually. And that was the only concern that they had with this plan before they implemented the methamphetamine. First, they had the plan that they would. Uh, uh, have this 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 blitz campaign, and then the, the concerns were, but can they really stay awake for that long? And Hitler said, "Of course they can. They're German. They're superhumans." <laughs> right. <laughs> but in fact, they only could because they used methamphetamine. Because otherwise, it's simply not possible. And I mean, that idea that Professor Ranke had is revolutionary, and um, it's no surprise that the German army was the first army to use that, but not the last. Um, Amphetamines have since then become like a staple uh, for for military um, organizations all over the world. Um, so they they all kind of copied it, but not usually not with methamphetamine, but just with am amphetamines or with you know uh, uh, other forms of uh, amphetamines, which are still used today. Also by, for example, terrorists when they go into when they when they go into actions that that require you to stay awake for for a long time because it and it also has different effects it, it not only keeps you awake it also limits your fear and um, and uh, it limits your inhibition so you are less your conscience is um, you have less problems killing people on amphetamines so it is quite an efficient and obviously dangerous uh, drug right for for anybody with a weapon in the hand, in its in his or her hand so that leads me to the question why did the germans stop about 10 miles out of dunkirk was it more um a political struggle with the with the luftwaffe and the the wehrmacht or was it uh was there something else going on well that halt order that hitler issued is one of the great mysteries of uh, world war 2 and um I try to explain it pharmacologically in Blitz. That's the only explanation that I have. I mean, it's a psychological and pharmacological explanation. Hitler 
which is also an interesting story, always had problems with the army high command. From the beginning, they had different opinions on how to wage this war, uh, this World War II. Um, Hitler had different ideas than, than, um, than, than the high command. And um, when, the, uh, when, when, the tank, when the tank divisions, for example, Rommel's division, stormed through France, Hitler, even though he had given this order, was quite surprised by the actual speed on the ground. He was not a meth head himself. Uh, so he, he basically, he was in the map house looking at the map of France and, and, and it just couldn't believe how fast they were going. And they, he couldn't understand that they would not act the way a division usually acts with you know, backing up and, and making bridgeheads and, 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 and securing the positions and all that, that military stuff that you learn. Uh, these, these tank divisions on meth, they just stormed and they never stopped. So Hitler became uh, skeptical of what they were actually doing. He didn't get it anymore. So at one point he, uh, he spoke to Göring, the head of the Luftwaffe, about this. And Göring said, uh, these generals, they don't listen to you anymore. They just do whatever they wish. Uh, this is not good. Uh, a, they will become very famous in the German public. Everyone will say we won the war because of these crazy generals. You, Hitler, you have to, you know, get back into the driver's seat. Otherwise, B, they will be, you know, vulnerable to maybe allied attacks, which was ridiculous because the allies were already beaten, basically. And C, Göring wanted to have uh, the victory for himself. So he said to Hitler, I can finish off the British troops from the air with the Luftwaffe which was a ridiculous idea because you can't really destroy. I mean, maybe you can nowadays, but at the time it was not a good idea to try to destroy a whole, a whole ground, the whole ground troops of the enemy by bombing them from the air. It, it would have been much better to do it on the ground as they were already doing it. But uh, Hitler issued this halt order uh, in order to, you know, become the, decisive force again in this campaign. And that was this big mistake because that way the British could escape through Dunkirk, evacuate back to Great Britain and uh, stay, uh, you know, a sizable force uh, during the rest of the war and eventually beat Germany. You, you explain these characters really well, you characterize them very well. I like um, the Luftwaffe, the head of the Luftwaffe being, you know, this, I mean, heroin addicted, wearing flamboyant clothes and in, in the middle of Nazi Germany. And then, you know, um, Hitler being egoic. And how, how much do you think that these uh, individual characters and how they how, how much do you think their personalities affect directly history? Because it seems to me like that egoic act that Hitler took stopping you know the military 10 miles from dunkirk it seems like that is like an obvious example of you know um a personality shaping history yeah i think that personalities are highly responsible to sh for shaping history i mean when you know the heads of states are not robots that act in a some kind of neutral, rational way. I mean, they're, they're human beings with, with, you know, problems in their private lives, which then, you know, magnify their political decisions. Uh, also in, in England, I mean, that they had a, a guy called, uh, a guy like Churchill uh, was very important for Great Britain, like a maniac. He's a maniac, just like Hitler. So you need a maniac to beat a maniac. Also, uh, Stalin in, in the Soviet Union was such a maniac. So Hitler had two maniacs against him. Uh, if, uh, and, and, and that was good for the, for, the, for the coalition against Hitler that they were so strong, that they were such strong personalities. And, but obviously, the, for in, within the Nazi um, uh, uh, dictatorship, um, the personalities maybe were even more important because it was not a rational system. I think like in London, 
um, they would actually discuss. And the same actually they did in Moscow, like uh, Stalin would discuss or would actually lead leave his generals to lead the war effort. Uh, he wouldn't uh, micromanage everything like Hitler did. Um, so it's, it's important also that you can, uh, that you can also uh, tone down your personality and let the professionals do their, do what they can do best. So Stalin was good with that. He said to his generals, you lead the war, basically. I mean, you, I, he, he would, he would let them you know, make decisions. Uh, and I think it was the same in, in Great Britain. Churchill didn't make every decision, but I, I think they made a lot of rational uh, decisions, which were helpful for their war effort. While in, in the in the Nazi uh, clique, there were basically no rational decisions made. Everything was uh, determined by mood, by ideology, by by drug highs. And not really by the reality on the ground. So um, that's why I think in the end the Nazi system had to fail because it was just not corresponding to the reality in the world, not relating to the reality in the world. That makes sense. Um, I've got one more big question for you, Norman. Uh, you released a new book just recently about um, resistance to the Nazis. I think it's a specific um, person, but you know, how common was German resistance to the Nazi regime? You know, was it a very common thing? Was it not common at all? What's your sense about that? Yeah, you're talking about my book, The Bohemians, uh, about um, two lovers, lovers, uh, Haro and Libertas, who created the largest resistance network within Berlin against the Nazis. Um, and in fact, their actions against the dictatorship were quite unusual. Um, resistance against the Nazis was uh, a fringe phenomenon. Uh, most people agreed uh, or at least kept their mouths shut. It was very dangerous to do something against the regime. Um, the uh, Gestapo was trying to monitor the whole, you know, population. So um, th that's why I wrote this book about the, the Bohemians, this group in Berlin, because they were really brave. And they said, even if it might cost us our lives, we cannot say yes to what is going on. We have to try to find ways uh, how we can, you know, say no and how we can educate people about the, the the horror that's going on. So resistance is rare, but when it occurs, it's highly interesting. Definitely. Quite interesting. Well, Norman, um, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people find your books? Um, they can go to um, the local bookshops, which still exist on our uh, in our in, on our planet and uh, i think they're actually opening up again all over the world so it's worth going again and looking at these strange things which are called books <laughs> picking them up and uh, yeah you can buy blitz or the bohemians um obviously you can also order it online or um yeah but just don't download it because that's really that's not good and that's i don't good. earn anything and it costs money to write these books so go to the bookshop that sounds great well thanks norman we really appreciate it it was a pleasure i'm sending all the best wishes to the united states of america we appreciate it <laughs> thank you thanks for listening We'll be back next week with a new episode of Narratives.